More profound scientific evidence of Noah's Flood found in tsunami deposits and dinosaur tracks, as well as questions about Noah's Flood from a viewer. This is Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy, made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, and now carried on the Chris Cinema Network, ChrisCinema.com, Christian Cinema at its finest. Excellence in Pirate Broadcasting, we continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. We believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain because he wants you to use it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you will find us. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. In our Noah's Flood episode, we were discussing various geological formations that are alleged to have formed in a desert, and therefore could not possibly have been formed during a worldwide flood. These formations were then discovered to have indeed been formed underwater. Another significant lesson was taken from the Japan tsunami of 2011, published in the Journal of Marine Geology. Though the area with the highest recorded tsunami waves of 20 meters was just west of Kasenuma Bay, the sand that these huge waves deposited on land was still only a mere 30 centimeters thick. 20 days after the horrible tsunami hit the port of Kasenumu Bay, emergency surveys were conducted in the bay to make sure that ships were able to enter the harbor. The initial survey did verify that ships could safely transit the bay, but they made an unexpected discovery. Large sand dunes had been formed by the tsunami in the seabed. The dunes were typically a few meters high, about six feet, 20 meters long, in water 10 to 15 meters deep. Now, we would refer to these underwater dunes as sand waves. Now, I have had old earth geologists specifically argue that sand waves cannot form quickly nor in fast currents. Thus, they claimed that various sand waves found throughout the geologic record would exclude a watery catastrophe on the scale of a global flood. So here we see multiple surprises. Not only did sand waves form fast and with a fast current, they formed in surprisingly deep water. So, sand wave formations can be made during a global flood. This has implications for the interpretation of numerous geological formations found throughout the world. These formations were alleged to exclude a worldwide flood, but now it appears they may be dramatic confirmation of a worldwide flood. Another piece of evidence that has four times been used as alleged evidence against a global flood has been dinosaur tracks. We have what was called a dinosaur stampede of fossil footprints in Australia. Presumed to have been made on land, the tracks were recently reinterpreted to have been made in water, with many of the tracks being made by swimming dinosaurs. The report came out in the January 8th Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, documenting a fossil site in Western Australia where many of the tracks are nothing more than scratch marks from what was obviously a dinosaur being buoyed up by the water, clawing at the dirt as it swam along. Now, this is certainly not the first instance of fossilized dinosaur tracks showing evidence of swimming. I've had the privilege of studying multiple dinosaur track sites throughout North America, and I have yet to see one that didn't obviously have water involved. Every single one of the dinosaur track sites were made in what can best be described as tidal flats. Deborah Mickelson of Colorado University at Boulder presented a paper at the 2005 GSA 
documenting what appeared to be a trail of dinosaur tracks from a dinosaur walking and getting buoyed up by the water more and more, losing contact with the seafloor. Now, I, I totally agree with their interpretation. Makes complete sense. However, there's a catch. This drawing does not depict reality whatsoever. The fossil footprints are in the middle of a series of rock layers. Now, according to Stino's stratigraphic principles laid out in the 1600s and still adhered to today, it would be assumed that those layers were laid down horizontally. This wasn't some seashore. The principle of initial horizontality. Strata, either perpendicular to the horizon or inclined to the horizon, were at one time parallel to the horizon. Now, nobody disagrees with this. Therefore, these tracks were not made by some dinosaur wading into the sea, but rather the ground was flat, a tidal flat. And as the dinosaur was happily walking along, the water came in and buoyed the dinosaur up until it lost contact with the ground. This is powerful evidence of a large catastrophic flood, not some dinosaur visiting the sea, especially in light of the fact that other dinosaur tracks were found in that area that were not swimming. And layers containing dinosaur tracks are typically provincial to continental in size. For example, the Lake Cretaceous of Glen Rose, Texas, famous for its innumerable dinosaur tracks, and yes, human footprints among those dinosaur tracks, that layer is acknowledged by the evolutionary community as a tidal flat. Except that that tidal flat covered a huge portion of North America. Now that layer has countless clam burrows from clams that were obviously buried alive catastrophically by the limey mud. Dinosaurs and people walked in that mud more layers were laid down on top of that. Then the clams attempted to burrow their way out through those layers. The clams are found by the millions to billions buried alive in the closed position just a few layers above the dinosaur tracks. Now tell me, was that accomplished over millions of years? Or a giant watery catastrophe real quick like? Now this was no calm sea. This was a huge, watery catastrophe. The evidence is best explained, and I would dare say only explained, by a worldwide flood. That flood was gaining more and more upon the land with each tidal wave. The evidence is best explained by the history recorded in the Bible, which talks about a worldwide flood that was judgment upon mankind from God. Now, Jesus warned us about another judgment to come at the end of the age. The people who did not listen to Noah's warning of the judgment to come perished. Will you listen to the warning from God about another judgment to come? Where will you be at the Great White Throne Judgment? With Vancouver Mayor Gregor Robertson signing a proclamation to declare February 12th as International Darwin Day, I thought I'd briefly mention the Question Evolution Project also set aside on the same day for similar reasons. Cowboy Bob Sorensen put together the project in proper spirit of scientific inquiry. After all, good science questions everything, right? So is it not then anti-science to say that one cannot question evolution, hmm? In his proclamation, Mayor Robertson declared, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is recognized as the foundation of modern biology, an essential tool in understanding the natural world and the development of life on Earth. Cowboy Bob and true science seekers then ask the question, is it really? After all, natural selection was originally a creationary postulation and was uh, <clears throat> borrowed by Darwin. That's right, Darwin's brainchild, which has brought him so much fame, was plagiarized from a creationist. 
And I show in Carivo rant number 110 that natural selection only explains the survival of the fittest, not the arrival of the fittest. And natural selection turns evolutionary theory upside down, where the lowly bacteria outpopulate and outsurvive the more complex life forms. It's the opposite of upwards onwards evolution. Secondly, as can be seen in Crevo rant number 93, evolution must violate well-established biological laws, like the laws of biogenesis. So how then can evolution be the foundation for understanding biology if evolution must violate biological laws and observations? Mayor Robertson also declared that Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection has provided and continues to provide the basis for great advances in science, medicine, and philosophy. Really? What advances, Mr. Robertson? Name one. Because I can name you hundreds of examples where evolutionary theory has hindered scientific research, and in particular, medical research. Junk DNA, the evolutionary idea which concluded that the great majority of our DNA was useless leftovers from our evolutionary ascent. Creationists, making predictions based on their creationary worldview, predicted that there was purpose to the junk DNA, and it wasn't junk at all. Well, guess which worldview made the correct prediction? Guess which worldview hindered the scientific research that discovered there was important purpose to the junk DNA. That's right, evolution failed in its predictions, whereas creation succeeded in its predictions. Vestigial organs, of which there were over a hundred claimed to be in the human body alone, useless parts and organs in the human body, left over from our evolutionary ascent. Yeah, because of this evolutionary thinking, Doctors hacked out people's tonsils for years. After all, the tonsils were just useless evolutionary leftovers. Well, I would like you to tell that to the people who were paralyzed for life, because it turns out their tonsils provided protection from things like polio before their tonsils were cut out because of evolutionary thinking. And yes, I will go down that disturbing road on a show someday where we will deal with the dreadful social and philosophical implications of evolutionary theory, such as eugenics, man-made selection of the fittest. I'm sorry, Mr. Robertson. Evolution and Darwin are not something to be celebrated. Instead, I hope you viewers will join the millions of others in questioning evolution on International Question Evolution Day, February 12th. There's a pile of resources you can get on Cowboy Bob's project site, as well as CMI's 15 questions for evolutionists. Stick around, we'll be right back after this short break. This program sponsored in part by Genesis Park, found at genesispark.com, where we say dinosaurs are living evidence of a powerful creator and by Canada's first permanent creation museum in the heart of Alberta's dinosaur beds, the Big Valley Creation Science Museum, bvcsm.com, and by you, our financial supporters. Funny, Fast and Furious. Ian's Crevo rants cover a multitude of topics in an easy-to-understand comical way. Complicated subjects that normally make your brain hurt hurt a lot less when Ian explains them while wearing his anti-government mind-reading equipment. Have questions about carbon-14 dating, natural selection, thermodynamics, or what on earth is he doing there? Three volumes of rants on DVD. Take your pick for $15 each, plus shipping and handling, or order all three as a package and save yourself 10 bucks. Order online today at Ian's Bookstore. Woohoo! Mail for me? Hmm. Conveniently in theme with the rest of the show this week, I got a question in from Christina in Alberta. Dear Ian, was there really two of every kind of animal on the Ark? How is this possible? Isn't there tons of different species that haven't been discovered yet? And from all areas all over the globe? 
How did Noah collect them all, and how did he get them all in there? It's blowing my mind. Thanks for writing in, Christina. That is an excellent question, and a loaded one, too. Now, let's dissect it. First of all, just how many animals would Noah have needed to bring on the ark? Now, while there is an incredible number of species, certainly over a million, notice that the vast majority of them survive just fine in the water. In fact, the vast majority live in the water, and thus Noah would not need to take them on board the ark. Now, think about it. Fish, sea plants, squid, sea insects, crabs, clams, lobsters, whales and dolphins, sea anemones, sharks, etc. Just take a quick look at invertebrate zo zoology sometime to get a quick grasp on the incredible variations of invertebrate sea critters alone. Now, many of those not falling into those categories would still survive a flood just fine, such as most amphibians many reptiles like turtles, crocodiles, alligators, etc. So what kind of numbers would you need to take on board the ark? Now you need to understand, as we discussed in past shows, the dog kinds could all come from one dog kind, something like a wolf. From there, all the dog kinds arise into the variations we have today. Now, this is not upwards onwards evolution. This is variation within the kind, which we discussed previously. Thousands of years of evolution has caused dogs to evolve into dogs. Suffice it to say, though, only one pair of dogs is needed to represent all the dog kinds we have today. Now, even that word species was invented by a creationist, Carl Linnaeus who was trying to classify life forms for simplicity's sake. It had absolutely nothing to do with evolution, nor evolutionary ascent. In fact, he named them species because he believed they were specially created. My friend Tom Hennigan just recently published a paper uh, dealing with the problem of identifying species and kinds uh, strictly relating to amphibians. Thankfully, the paper is open source and available here. That'll give you an idea of the challenges facing definition of both species and kinds. Now, Morris and Whitcomb, in their landmark book, The Genesis Flood, figured Noah needed to take no more than 35,000 animals on board the ark. John Wood Morpey's book, Noah's Ark, A Feasibility Study, is an excellent book I'd highly recommend. Now, in there, he actually estimated as low as 2,000, but probably as many as 16,000 animals were needed. Now, we're going to go with 50,000 animals, just for fun. So how much space would that require on board the Ark? Not a whole lot, actually. Now, of course, I would claim that Noah brought even the largest land animals on board the Ark, the dinosaurs, elephants, etc. However, Noah would have brought babies on board for multiple reasons. They take less space, they eat less, drink less, they don't go to the bathroom much. We like that. They sleep lots. When they get off the ark, they have a full reproductive lifespan ahead of them. Now, comparing this hadrosaur egg to just the skull of a full-grown hadrosaur, you can see the dinosaur started off really, really small and got really, really big. But even taking into account the adult sizes of the animals, the average size of all of the animals still comes in only about the size of a sheep. So taking the measurements of the ark provided in the Bible, the ark works out to about the equivalent volume of 596 railroad boxcars. Now, a typical double-decker stock carrying boxcar can hold about 240 sheep. So, to accommodate 50,000 animals would still only take up the equivalent of 209 railroad cars, or less than two-fifths of the entire volume of the Ark, leaving the other half of the Ark for food, water, building supplies for the future, etc. The bottom line is there was lots of room on the Ark. But how did Noah get animals from the different continents? if he was building the ark in, say, the Middle East. Well, actually, there wasn't any different continents during Noah's time. 
we would contend that continental division occurred at the time of Noah's flood. In fact, this whole concept of continental division actually came from the Bible. Pellegrini was reading Genesis where it said God separated the waters into one place and the land appeared. He deduced from this passage that it must also mean the land was in one place. He then started experimenting with how the continents could perhaps fit together. Later on, his continental division theory was hijacked by those who believe in deep time, labeled it plate tectonics, and claimed it took millions of years. Now, for a number of reasons, we know it did not take millions of years at all, but I'll save that for another show. For the moment, you can see how a biblical idea is twisted around to allegedly refute the Bible when it does no such thing. The idea came from the Bible. The Bible also implies that God brought the animals to Noah. Now, interestingly, during the horrible tsunami of Indonesia, while some 300,000 people were killed, yet there were essentially no animals killed. The animals somehow knew danger was approaching and fled to higher ground, escaping the disaster. So why wouldn't the animals know that a worldwide flood was coming? So then, how did the animals disperse after the flood and get to all the different continents? Well, it's ironic that the anti-creationists attempt to use this as an argument against Noah's flood. They will point to the marsupials, like the duckbill platypus in Australia. They will claim that the platypus evolved there, and that's why they're only found in Australia. However, when a platypus fossil is found in Argentina, a completely different continent, guess what they say? Oh, they must have migrated there when there was land bridges. Now, we creationists readily accept that there was land bridges after the flood, probably for hundreds of years. There are thousands of mountains under the oceans called table mounts. Now, these are mountains that have been planed off flat by water action. Yet these planed surfaces are one to 2,000 meters, three to 6,000 feet below sea level. So for a time at least, the ocean levels were thousands of meters lower than they are now. Now, if you lower the oceans by a mere 100 meters, 300 feet, you have land bridges connecting almost every continent. That's right, you could walk from China to Australia to South America, North America, and if you or a herd of animals walk a mere one mile per day for 10 years, you have walked 3,650 miles. You can walk from Mexico to Alaska, or from Canada to China. So, as you can see, getting the animals to and from the ark is a non-issue. In fact, any anti-creationist who tries to argue otherwise inadvertently shoots themselves in the foot because they must apply the very same reasoning to their beliefs that we do, except they claim the land bridges were around for millions of years, not hundreds. So why didn't the marsupials migrate to other parts of the planet? They certainly had enough time. I hope that answers your questions, Christina. YouTuber Orge121 wrote in regarding the Noah's Flood episode. If I remember correctly, I asked why no creationist had ever modeled the flood of Noah. I consider that a quality inquiry. I consider that a quality inquiry as well. Uh, there has actually been a number of flood models put together and intensely scrutinized. Uh, I was privileged, uh, a privileged participant in what was called the Flood Science Review, which was a written debate over Noah's flood and the pre-flood world. The debate took over a year and a half with Hollywood producer Joe Bardwell funding the debate. The results were published in an ebook that is a must read for anyone even remotely interested in the subject of geology and Noah's flood. Don't let the 1700 pages intimidate you. Because of the way it is laid out, it's quite easy to follow. You can download a copy of that book for a donation of any amount at In Jesus Names Productions website, ijnp.org. If I may suggest, 
please be generous in your donation as Joe put a pile of his own personal money into funding that project, which was a monumental project of great benefit to the creation community. With regards to my commentary last week on the population problem, YouTuber eQuestions wrote in, I love this argument, you're spot on. It is a huge problem for deep time and one very seldom talked about. Let me bring up the fact that Wazulu was very gracious to the Evos in this vid. He only spoke about Homo sapiens and only went back 200,000 years with his 0% growth rate. If we really wanted to be fair, we should have gone back to Homo habilis, which means a growth rate of 0% for 2 million years. The human population should be extinct many times over with those population numbers. Ted from Pittsburgh also wrote in with similar concepts. I have always been interested in the population problem, and I think genetic entropy by Sanford was awesome. I've been wondering for some time whether a truly human population could exist for 190,000 years on this earth without agriculture, without good hunting weapons, bow and arrows, without warm and or protective clothing, and protection of the skin and eyes from the sun, without medical assistance for wounds, without midwives, and without a population community of at least a thousand. Also, the first humans were said to be two million years ago, so their existence at near extinction levels seems even more impossible. I don't see how the first human pair that evolved from a line of apes could have stayed alive with no human companions. I understand that Neanderthals go back 200,000 years ago, but huge numbers of caveman humans lived in the two million or one million period before the alleged Neanderthals appeared. Indeed, I left those out for simplicity and to stay focused on my main points. The Bible just plain fits the actual data and evidence. The skeptics must call upon a lack of data, an absence of data, and wishful thinking. However, in the end, I must also admit that I am also arguing from an absence of evidence. Just like all those bodies from the alleged millions of years are missing, so also the body of Christ is missing. If he had not risen from the dead to prove he was God, someone, somewhere, would have produced his body. None of the apostles would have willingly died for their faith if they hadn't seen Jesus rise from the dead. Christ led the way through death into new life so we could know he, he was who he said he was. That he was the way, the truth, and the life. All you have to do is acknowledge that you have sinned and ask him to forgive you of your sins. And he promised that he is just and faithful to forgive you and give you a new life. Why don't you ask him today to forgive you and give you a new life? I'm going to call that a wrap. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next Genesis Week. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for now. Remember, you can send in your comments to comments at genesisweek.com or send us a tweet at Genesis Week or go to genesisweek.com, which is our YouTube channel. Find the most recent show and leave a comment there. Remember those words from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We'll see you next week. We need your support to help keep this program on the air. You can help by making a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office, Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K2P4. You can also sign up for Ian's newsletter detailing current research and news items at ianjuby.org. Thank you.